This video is sponsored by Deep Cut Studios. For a wide range of fantastic gaming resources such as battle mats, dice trays and pre-painted bases, check out the description below. Hi guys and welcome back to TNG Productions. My name is Tom and I'm going to be playing a new system on the channel today, which is Brutality, which is a skirmish war game that is miniature agnostic, created by Scott Wainwright. And the premise is very simple. The Brutality, or the Brutal Realm as it's known, is ruled by the goddess Ishtar, who now long fallen away wants to recoup her powers. And how she does that is she brings the greatest warriors through space and time to this Brutality to live and fight and die in her name, and each death will gain her power power. Now any warriors that do die in the brutality are not lucky enough to just rest in peace. Unfortunately they are reborn the next day exactly in the same place that they had previously woken up. So it's basically like a respawn and our warriors need to try to try and find a way to get to the top of the pile or break out of this brutal realm. So this game can be played single player, co-op or versus. I'm going to be having a go at a single player campaign using an AI deck today. And without further ado I'll show you my crew and we'll get set up. And this is the crew that I'm going to be using for this single player campaign. Now I love the fact that Brutality is kind of single or co-op or versus. The single player game is really interesting because you've got enemies that have an AI logic tree and on top of that you've also got the ability to kind of grow your campaign with XP and new abilities. So. As you can see, the great thing about these miniature agnostic games is we get to give some miniatures that haven't seen the light of day their time to shine. And these guys are just beautiful. These were painted by Ian Torrance, super best friend of the channel. And you can see the beautiful work that he's done on them. They deserve to be on the channel more. And unfortunately, he finished painting them just as their game was kind of canned. So this is their, their second opportunity to do well. Now, the nice thing is, aesthetically with this, you've got the lore that kind of covers steampunk, futuristic, fantasy. I'm leaning very much into the fantasy, but we'll see how we go. And the faction that you can choose can be a variety of good guys or bad guys, question mark. These guys are the Oath Sworn. They're the closest you're gonna to get to like a police force. They have a very simple rule, which is within the brutality, if you attack someone first, you're in the wrong, because that's when fighting happens. So because of that, kind of everyone hates them, because they try and enforce control in a land that's basically baying for blood, but it means they're quite strong and elite. So we'll go through them bit by bit and I'll talk you through what they do. So you can create your characters from scratch. These guys are all level zero and they have a base archetype, which are the melee, ranged, support or fast. And then you've got other ones like monsters and loci afterwards. And as they gain experience, they can level up. So our main man here, Furnace, he is our leader and he is a melee archetype. You can give them passive ability. So I've given him burning because, you know, literally carrying a furnace on his back where he can attack people. Uh, he is armed, meaning that when he does damage to people, he will also be able to kind of wound them for additional damage, which is really, really nice. We have Alloy over here. He is our fast runner, so because of that, he can move extra, extra fast. He's like a 10-inch move, I think. And he is favoured by Ishtar. He's kind of won her favour, so when he searches things or gains objectives, you roll a d10, usually bad stuff happens if you get a 1 or a 10. He can ignore one of the results, which is great. Uh, we've got Best Girl Cinder. She is our ranged archetype. You can see here with her crossbow, which does piercing damage. That's the upgrade I've given her. You have got Anvil, big boy here. He is rightly, as you might expect, sturdy because look at that shield. Uh, so he's going to be our kind of protector. And then we have the lovely Hearth. She is our support piece archetype. And because of that, she's got some spells. She's got Protect to make people's armor a bit better. And she's got some base healing. So you've got Furnace, Alloy, and uh, Anvil, which are all able to do wound damage to people. Also Cinder with her crossbow, Hearth, the only one that can't. And what I've done is they're against some Barbarians today. They are just a mirror archetype. So you've got their leader which is this witch. So she is exactly the same as Hearth in terms of stats. The only thing is she's got different spells. So I think I've given her like dart or missile, I think it's called, and she's got curse. You've got two melee beaters with the ax and the sword. So one does crushing damage, one does piercing. You've got an archer, which mirrors Cinder. And you've got a fast one, which mirrors uh, Alloy here, which is the person with the spear. Now, there are a variety of other things you can give your faction. This is going to be a relatively straightforward matchup because obviously I'm just learning the game to start with. So as these guys level up, the complexity of the enemies can go up a lot. And also the complexity of these guys, they can level up into different archetypes like berserkers or fighters or breachers or things like that. But for now, I'm just going to play it very simple. So I'm not going to be using command tokens, which is like an extra free ability each leader gives their crew. And I'm not going to use my faction trait for these guys, which is teamwork, which just makes them a little bit better. 
Finally, when you make your characters, you're able to make them a little bit more personable based on the miniatures you've got. So you can add a couple of stats to them. So for everyone, because they are heavily armored, I've increased their save by one. So they're, they're all save three, which is still not great, but pretty solid. And then I've just added things like, you know, additional movement for the fast guys or additional fighting skill for the fighters and all stuff like that. But I'm really looking forward to seeing how they develop and hopefully they'll survive this first battle. It's also why I've done a simple one because brutality can really live up to its name sometimes. So we'll set up the board and we'll see how we get on. And here we are all set up for today's game then. And my poor Oath Swarm, they've gone scavenging in these uh, in the vulture belt in the land that's very desolate. I think they've came across a really good camp and it's just been a trap. These barbarians have sprung an ambush and you can see are all around the outsides to close in. So because this is a scavenging mission, we put three markers out. You can see them, they are three red ones with little chests there. This is because this is the first Here They Come mission. And essentially what we do is we get VP for securing those and also for kills because that'll please Ishtar. I managed to roll, because every turn you have to roll like a random event, I managed to roll a very lucky one. There's a further gold treasure token you can see in the northwest by Alloy. And that's because I rolled hidden treasure and if I pick that one up I get some extra gold out of it, which is great. So, in terms of the game length, this is simply four turns. The bad guys have one initiative for turn one, but obviously it's alternate activations. They've also got a hatred they've each rolled for, which I will discuss as they activate. But yeah, this, this is kill or be killed and try and get as much treasure as you can. So, let's get the first turn underway. So first activation of the game is going to be this spear wielding barbarian. Now she has rolled hatred of range units, so she's gonna be going for Cinder as this goes on. But her AI logic tree suggests that the first thing she wants to do is get into cover and try to secure some objectives. Now you have to kind of go in order of who's weakest, but they're all pretty healthy at the moment. So we've gone the logical one who can score quickly. So she is simply in her movement phase, gonna to move to here, try and get behind this big rock so Cinder can't shoot her and then she's gonna scavenge this marker. So, roll a d10, let's see what we get. We get a six, fantastic. So she manages to secure some supplies from that, gains a VP, nothing bad happens because she didn't get a one or a 10, and that's her done. So I think for the Oathsworn's first activation, we're gonna match like for like, and Alloy's gonna go against his fast rival. Now he has slightly more to consider, because when you interact with a marker, you can't be within six inches and line of sight of an enemy. So he can't, even though he's moved 10, dash down here and interact with this one. He's gonna need his buddy Anvil to maybe uh, do some damage and move that person away. So he's gonna play it safe for now. We're gonna try and secure this hidden treasure here. So we're gonna go here, just outside of six. We're gonna see what we get now. We get a seven, fantastic. He does secure it. And because this was an additional objective, he does remove this token from play because it's not one of our main scavenging points. Back to the Barbarians then, we're gonna go with this Archer. Now he also rolled uh, Hatred of Range, so he's also really angry with Cinder. I don't know what she's done to annoy these Barbarians, maybe it's because she's on their actual kind of platform or maybe she's the biggest threat with that big flaming crossbow, but he wants to take her out. So his move action, he's just gonna move to some cover just over here. Now he could take aim, but he wants to kind of eliminate this cover for Cinder. And then he's just gonna pop a shot at her. So for a range attack, he has two dice on his bow and he's looking to basically score higher than her dexterity, which is a six. Let's see how he does. We get a six and we get a two. Now, unfortunately, neither of those are higher than her dexterity of six. So she is very lucky and has been able to dodge that. However, she would have had to make some saving rolls should they have gone through. So that's him all done. So seeing the attacks are starting to come in, there's arrows pinging off this cover. Our support piece hearth is gonna go. She is simply gonna move herself into slightly more uh, protective range away from these arrows. She's gonna duck behind here. And she's gonna try and cast one of her powers. Now for a power, you have to roll within her willpower and her willpower is seven, so she's got a good chance here. She's got a healing spell and a protect spell. And seeing that Cinder has got a lot of people that hate her, we're gonna try and put up a protect spell. So we need a seven or below here. We get a five, fantastic. And this will add two to Cinder's save should she need it. So we'll just put a little token here to say she's protected. Back to these barbarians then, we've got this big lad with an ax. Now he's rolled hatred of melee, so he kind of wants to get stuck into furnace and anvil, and that's exactly what he's gonna to try to do. So he is gonna move himself, his move of six inches to here, and then in his combat phase, he's gonna to attempt to run. So we're gonna roll a d10, and that's how far he's gonna go in inches, but he can't go higher than his six inch of movement. So he moves an inch. I mean, it's not the greatest run. He just kind of bellows towards anvil, but that will do for him. Well, our boy is not one to stand down from a challenge. Anvil's gonna step up. We're gonna see our first round of combat. So, 
In the movement phase, he's gonna move six inches. Now you cannot uh, end the move within two inches of the enemy. So you could be at two inches, but not within that number. And that is because you then need to go for a charge. So what Anvil's gonna do, he's gonna to attempt to charge this barbarian. So we roll a d10, and as long as we get not a one, he should be able to get into combat here. We get a five, he has all the movement in the world. So he then is going to barrel in and try and see if we can dish out some pain to this guy here. They go shield to the face. So all combat happens simultaneously, but we'll roll them one by one just to make it nice and easy. So because Anvil is going first, uh, or going in as the chargee, he gains an extra attack. So he has two attacks, which will go up to three, and he needs to roll within his fight skill. So his fight skill is six. So we get three dice, and we get, oh, that's gonna sting, right? Two ones and a nine. So the nine will miss, but a one counts as a critical success. So that's actually four hits that he's managed there, which we'll talk about in a second. However, the Barbarian does get to attack back. He is also fight six. They're all go attacking at the same time. See what he gets. He gets an eight and a three, so that one misses. So the Barbarian manages to secure one hit. Anvil, on the other hand, has four. So we then need to see if saves can be made. Now saves are quite hard in Brutality just because of the nature of the combat that happens. We have to see if each hit does damage to us with a saving roll. We have to roll a d10 and get equal to or less than our saves. And we'll try and save this one hit to begin with. He needs to roll under or equal a save of three. He gets a six, so that wound will go through in a moment. However, this guy, this guy's gonna have a very bad day here. He's got to roll within his save of also a three with these four successes. He gets, oh, it's not too bad. Right, so a 10 critical fail, a two would be a success, and a one would actually be two successes, and this one is a miss here as well. So what we actually have is three saves there that would become to one going through. So it actually just drops him down by one wound, so he's down to two. We then, because we've had armed attacks go through, we need to see what injuries occur. So Anvil needs to roll for his attack first, see what injury he does to this Barbarian. He is doing what we would consider to be crushing damage because of his big hammer. So we get an eight, an eight would be confusion, which basically means the model must take a willpower check at the start of each activation. If he fails, he just scans, he just wanders around like scattered. The Barbarian is also doing crushing damage with his big kind of heavy axe. We'll see what he does back to Anvil. He gets a six, and that means Anvil gets a fracture, basically crumples his leg, and he gets minus two to his movement. And at the end of this, we just separate them by two inches as we knock this Barbarian back. Back over to this side then, we've got this Barbarian over here who's gonna try and see if he can scavenge a little bit before Furness gets stuck into him. So he's gonna move his six inches, just to keep himself outside of six of furnace. And he's gonna to attempt to secure some supplies. Let's see what he rolls. He gets a three, he is successful there, and that gains them another VP, taking them up to two. Worth also noting that guy with the sword has a hatred of melee as well, so him and Furnace are probably gonna need a big throwdown. But we're gonna see if we give him a hatred of range, because Cinder's gonna go now. He is just about within her arc of vision. She's gonna use her aim action, which will give a plus two to her rolls in a second, and she's gonna bop a crossbow bolt into his face, hopefully. So there's no cover or intervening terrain. These markers don't count. She has a crossbow which has a 20-inch uh, range and two shots, so we'll see what she gets. She needs to beat his dexterity which is five. So we get a nine and a two. So even with the plus two, that one will fail, but the nine will definitely hit for a success. Now it's not an unmodified roll of a, a 10, sadly, so it's not a crit, but it does go through. She has a piercing weapon, which is really interesting. So if she rolls a nine or a 10 on her to hit, the enemy suffers minus one to their save. So this guy's save that would normally be three, goes down to two, and we'll see if he's able to protect from it. Uh, he gets a seven, he does not, so he is going to take a wound, which will knock him down to two HP. But because this is a ranged weapon, it also does damage on the wounding chart. So this is a piercing weapon, as we said. Let's see what she rolls for it. She gets a seven, a seven is going to be blinded. The model sight is impaired and may only move during its next activation. No other actions may be taken, and then the effect goes afterwards. That's really handy and makes him quite susceptible to the next round. So that just leaves us with the leaders left to go. So we have this witch here. She hates support. She hates her fellow spellcasters with hearth. So she's going to very similarly 
Walk up to here and lock down this supply. Now she can't search it because Anvil is within six inches and line of sight of her, but she is there kind of stopping it from being collected and she's gonna try and pop a power at hearth. So I have a willpower of seven here, Barbarian. See what she gets. She gets a five, so she successfully casts and she's going to go with, ooh, she's got choices here. She's got missile or she's got curse. Let's play it simple. She's gonna go missile. So missile says roll a d10 and apply the following effects with no saves allowed. So let's see what we get. We get a five. That will do one wound chart roll to her with no saves allowed. Let's call this a piercing attack, seeing as it is a missile. That is a one. Unfortunately, that does nothing. She casts the power and half, just bats it away with her own kind of Hadouken. And that is the end of that, which is activation. So that just leaves our big boy Furnace to go and he is gonna try and see if he can deal with this swordsman. So he's gonna walk to the extremity of two inches and he's gonna to attempt to charge him. So we get an eight, we get well within. So he barrels into this guy with his attack. So Furnace usually would have a two attacks. He goes up to three. And obviously this guy, despite the fact that he's uh, a bit blinded at the moment, he does get to kind of counter attack as well. So they both have a fight skill of six. So Furnace gets uh, three successful hits there. That's not bad. Two, four, and two. On the counter attack, the Swordsman gets a 10, which is a critical fail and one success with the four. So Furnace has a save of three. Let's see if he can block this. He does not, he will take a point of damage and we'll see what his injury is in a moment. However, the Barbarian with his save of three, let's see what he's able to do. He, ooh, I'll tell you what, he makes one of them, but unfortunately two go through, which will deal his three wounds and take him out in a second. So let's see what Furnace's injury would be. From this, he gets an eight, which is agony, oof. This model must take a willpower check at the start of each activation. If it fails the check, then it's in agony and cannot make any attacks or actions in the action phase. If the willpower check is passed, the agony effect is immediately removed and can act as normal. That's, that's pretty good as a counter attack before you die, but Furnace has successfully eliminated this barbarian and secured a VP at the end of this first turn. And here's the picture at the end of the first turn. And yeah, Furnace did well to eliminate that Barbarian. I mean, he would have set him on fire with his burning sword anyway, but he's eliminated him. So the VP currently is one point to the Oathsworn and two to the Barbarians. They've been securing the objectives, even though Ishtar has been pleased with the killing of our good guys. Now, because they have lost the most models, the Barbarians will actually be able to go first as we now go into turn two. So I expect there's gonna be a lot of bloodshed here as we try and see if we can get them off these objectives and start catching up with points. So, so at this point, the AI logic tree starts to pay dividends a little bit more because we have to activate the model that is most likely to die first. And actually it's this Barbarian because he's taken a wound. So because he is confused, we have to roll a willpower test for him to begin with. So let's see if he can get within his willpower of five. He gets a three, he is successful, so he doesn't scatter, he doesn't wander off anywhere. Um, he can remove his confusion effect and then he's gonna get stuck in. So I'm actually not gonna move, he's just gonna see if he can charge Anvil because he hates him. So of course he's gonna try and get some damage in there. So see how far we charge. We charge seven inches easily, barrel straight back in for round two. So this Barbarian has got two attacks which will go up to three versus Anvil's two and where he's trying to get, uh, both of them trying to get within their fight value of six. We'll do the Barbarian first. He gets one success, two fails, that's not great for him. And Anvil will roll his to counter. Anvil gets, oh, a critical cool success and a fail. So because that's a critical success, it will actually become two successful hits. So we'll do our saves then. So Anvil has got to save against one attack. He needs to get three or below. He gets a nine, that fails, so he will take a wound. And because this guy is armed, he'll have to go on the wound chart a second. See if he gets his other leg crumpled. This Barbarian will have to save against two attacks. Again, he has got a save of three. He gets a four and a six. Unfortunately, he will take two wounds and that will eliminate him with his measly three HP getting absolutely butchered straight away. So Anvil's done well there. He's not only been able to take the hit, he's rebuffed it as well. So let's see what damage he's taken in return. So we said this was a crushing weapon the Barbarian was using. That is a five, that is bludgeon, which is minus two willpower. So Anvil's got a crushed leg and he's just taken a massive shot on the head, but he has managed to kill the guy 
with a combination of that old shield and hammer combo. Okay, for the Oathsworn then, we're gonna go with Alloy because he does not want to allow this person to just keep searching this supply. So he's super speedy at move 10. He's gonna move to here and he's gonna attempt to charge this Barbarian. So all he needs is to not get a one. It's a four, happy days. So he's gonna charge into her, they're both gonna turn and face and he's gonna attack. Now Alloy, because he's fast, is armed, as is she with her spear. However, our attacks are a little bit weaker than the big beefy guys we've seen so far. So we'll just rotate this so you can see this a bit better. Alloy has got one attack, which got up to two because he charged. Uh, the Barbarian has got one attack and they're both fight skill of six. So Alloy gets a 10, which is critical fail, but he also then gets a three, which is successful. The person with the spear gets a three. So they both succeed in putting a hit on each other. Both have a save value of three. So Alloy, is he able to save? Gets a three, is successful, no damage to him. The Barbarian, on the other hand, gets a four. So she will take a wound, which knocks her down to two health. And she will then need to take a wound chart roll. Now Alloy is using a knife, so it is a piercing weapon. So let's see what he does to her. He gets a five there, which is sliced, which is really good. He minuses her fighting skill by two as he cuts deep in that arm that's carrying a spear. We push the two away. Alloy wants to go with her there and separate them for now, but that's not a bad preemptive strike by our boy there. So that does mean that this spear user is actually our most likely to die barbarian, so she's gonna go next. She's simply gonna try and charge back in. So she gets a one, she fails, she is stuck there as she's kind of like been sliced and was recording from Alloy and doesn't quite have the guts to get Bower back in yet. So over to us then, Anvil is gonna step up and sadly, because he's had his leg crumpled in that fight with the guy with the big ax, I don't have a move of six, I have a move of four, so it would be great if I could charge into the rear arc of this person because I'd actually have a bonus, but unfortunately, he's just gonna like kind of limp himself around to here, and then he's gonna attempt to get a charge. Hopefully we can do a bit better than that girl with the spear. Let's see how we do. We get an eight, comfortably gets in, so she will turn to face him as he barrels into combat with her. And then we're just gonna throw some strikes. So Anvil is, luckily his fight value hasn't been damaged, so he's two attacks up to three, with a fight skill of six, whereas this uh, witch is a fight skill of five with one attack. So Anvil gets three successful hits there. She gets one successful hit coming the other way. That's not too bad. Now she unfortunately does not have an armed weapon, meaning that she will just do damage. She won't be able to do wound chart rolls because she's just batting him with like a, a staff or something. So we'll see if Anvil can save this with his save of three. He gets an eight, he does not, so he will take an additional wound, leaves him on one health, he's not particularly happy with that. But we'll see if she can save from his attacks. So she also has a save of three. Uh, she gets a 10, which fails, a four, which fails, and a two, which is a success. So she just about manages to stay alive with her single wound remaining, but it does mean she's probably gonna need to activate next. Now, Anvil would push her two inches back. We know there's kind of this marker in the way, so he will just push her around to this side, and then we'll see what wound chart roll she gets. So I get a successful wound chart roll per attack, I believe it is. So he could do some real damage to her here with his crushing weapon. So we get a six and a seven. A six is a fracture, which gives her minus two to her movement, and that's gonna be compounded with seven, which is a knockdown, which will actually knock her onto her backside, meaning she will need to stand up in a second. So that's not bad at all from Anvil. So we're gonna activate this mage then, and what the knockdown condition says is that basically you have to remove it to stand up and you cannot move or do anything until that condition's gone. So that's her movement phase done. Next thing she's gonna do, she's gonna try and cast a power. She's gonna try and chuck a missile at Anvil, see if she can finish the job on him. So she has a willpower of seven, needs to roll within it. That dice has gone flying underneath, but it is a five as it's gone under the terrain there. So she is successful, and this is a D10 and apply the following effects with no saves allowed. So she's trying to get, ideally, eight or more to do a damage to him. Hey, it's almost like it was predetermined. She gets an eight, he takes the damage, nothing can be done against that, and that will take our boy out and gain a VP for the Barbarians. Nice job there from the Witch. So even though he's lost an ally, Vernus is gonna try and see if he can score us some points. So he is going to attempt to search the supply in a moment, but he is in agony, remember, so he needs to pass a willpower save with his willpower six. 
He gets a one, he succeeds, his agony goes away as he kind of staunches the bleeding, and then he is gonna move himself around to here and try and search this token before the archer gets hold of him. So let's see what we get. We get a five, we are successful, it's not a one or a 10, so good things. That'll get us a VP in the bag. So we're left to go with this archer. He is simply gonna use his first action to aim, and then he's gonna try and shoot Cinder, because remember he gets a bonus if he kills her for VP. So he is firing two shots against her dexterity of six, but we get plus two to this roll. So we get an eight, which is super successful. We get a two, which unfortunately fails no matter what. So that will go through to hit Cinder and she will need to take a save. Now, thankfully, Hearth has protected her. So we have a save of five here that we're looking to protect from. We get a five, isn't that fortunate? So she is able to kind of stay alive and not get hit by that arrow shot from that archer behind the rock. So that leaves the Oath with some back-to-back -back activations then. So Cinder's gonna go first. She's gonna attempt to aim and then shoot back at this archer, get some revenge. Now he is in cover. So the way that cover works is it basically adds one to your save if you are up to 50% obscured and add two if you are 50% obscured or more. I'd say he's half obscured, just under. So he'll get plus one to his save. So Cinder's gonna aim and try and get his uh, dexterity score, which is a six, but she gets plus two to these rolls. She gets a seven, which is successful. Unfortunately, the three is not gonna be successful even after the bonus. So she secures a hit, but he is going to get his save. His save is usually three, he gets one for the cover, so he needs a four or less. He gets a six, it does not. So that is a wound that will go through. And because Cinder is shooting him with her piercing arrow, it will be a wound chart roll and we'll see what this is. This is a one, which unfortunately does nothing. So that leaves us with Hearth. Now when Hearth activates, all of the powers that she used last turn go away, so the shielded will go. She is equally concerned about the fact that there is this marker down here that is unprotected. So she is gonna walk her way around to here and she's gonna to attempt to charge her fellow mage. Now this could be dicey, because even though this mage has got a kill so far, if she can kill Hearth, she'll get some bonus VP because she hates them. So we'll see what Hearth does first with her charge. She gets three inches, that's all good. So she manages to get stuck in. And these two are gonna to go toe to toe. So Hearth has one attack normally, goes up to two. The mage has one attack base and they're both a fight skill of five as far as things go, because the mage, unfortunately, is only on minus two movement. She's not been affected that way. So half managed to secure a five and a two. So she gets two successes. The mage gets a seven. She fails. Oh, so this is two saves that are gonna need to be made by this mage. Otherwise, she's gonna fall down and get destroyed. She has a save of three. She gets a four and a six, that is not enough. She explodes in just a, a flurry of weapons and hammers and swords, and that secures another VP for our Oath Sworn to end this turn. And this is the picture at the end of the second turn, and you can see there there's been a big swing in points. The Oath Sworn are up four to three after several kills have gone through. You may also notice that the back, the uh, Barbarian with the Spear has healed a wound and that is because of the co-op event table. I rolled a four, which is just a flesh wound. The enemy model with the lowest HP regains one, so she's feeling a lot better about life. But as we can tell, they're, they're really gonna have to try and get some damage in these Barbarians because those that are left standing are actually relatively healthy of the O Sworn. So we'll see if they can do some mopping up as we go into turn three. Okay, so we're gonna go with the Barbarians then. Even though this one over here has got more wounds than the Archer, I think she's actually more likely to die because Alloy's right up in her face. So she is gonna activate first. Now, because she's at minus two fight skills, she's gonna try and be a bit more clever about this charge. So her first action, because she is move 10, is to move around to the back of Alloy. Because if she can get a charge into him, into his rear arc, she'll get plus two to her fight skills. So that'll mitigate the minus two she's got from her injury. So we'll see if she makes it this time. She gets a six, she is super successful. So she's gonna charge into his rear arc. He will turn and face, but she will get a plus two bonus to her fight skill of six, which went down to four, back up to six. So she has one attack that will become two. She is looking to hit that. Alloy has got the same fight skill with one attack in return. So she gets, ooh, two successes there, just as well she did go into the rear arc. Alloy in return gets a success as well. Fantastic, so you know, both hit each other. So Alloy has a save of three, we'll see if he can make it. 
He gets a four, he does not, so he will take a wound, and we will roll on the chart in a second. Uh, so she will take a wound, the Barbarian. And then Alloy, in return, he's got two saves he needs to make, and he gets a critical success, lucky boy. So even though this one was a fail, he would save both. So actually the Barbarian has came out worse there with that one attack that Alloy did in return. However, she does manage to push him back. So she's the one who actually needs to take the wound roll. So this will be a piercing attack and we'll see what it is. It is an eight, which is agony. She's in pain just like Furnace was earlier. She's not having great luck against Alloy, is she? So while the fighting continues, Hearth is going to play it nice and safe. She's going to walk up to Subjective and see if she can secure some supply. If she gets a 10, that is not great. So we have to now see what happens so because we are fighting in the vulture belt on a roll of a 10 both warbands feel the burning of starvation in their bellies roll a d10 for each model on the board on a roll of a 10 the model has its movement fighting skill dexterity willpower all reduced by two until the end of the game which stacks with all other effects as well as multiple times the 10 is rolled okay well done, Hearth. You've made everyone realise that they're starving and hungry. So, Hearth, do you roll a 10? No, you roll a 1. You're happy. Right. This archer. Happy. Furnace off camera. Happy. Cinder. Happy. Oh, close, Cinder. You got lucky. The, the poor and lucky girl with the spear. She's lucky this time. And Alloy. Okay, so we managed to get no 10s. That is lucky, but we do not secure a VP for trying to get these supplies. She just realizes inside is just hunger. So realizing everyone's had their neutral gains, which is good, this arch is gonna go. Even though he hates Cinder, he's not having much luck hitting her. So he's gonna move himself around into full cover from her shooting here, and he's gonna pop a shot off at half instead. So no aiming bonus here. He's gonna roll two attacks and try and beat her dexterity of a four. He gets an eight and a six. Both have been successful. So she will need to take two saves, looking for threes. She gets a four and a six, so she will take two wounds. That's not a bad bit of shooting there, is it? Knocks her down to one health. So yeah, she's, she's definitely feeling it there. And we have to see what damage is done to her. So these are piercing attacks. We get a one and a seven. The one is nothing, it's disregarded. The seven on the other hand is blinded, which I think we saw earlier. She can only move during her next activation. No other actions can be taken. So that's not too bad at all. So these two are gonna to continue to do the dance of death. So Alloy is gonna run around. He's gonna go, you know, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And I'm the gander. So he's gonna try and charge her. He gets a nine, he gets all of the charge in the land. She will turn and face him. Now he will get plus two to his fight skill, which means he's on fight skill eight. And bearing in mind, she's on minus one to her. So she is on four. So Alloy secures. Oh, that is a critical success and a two, so he gets three hits there. And she gets a 10, she gets a critical fail. Well, it's not looking good, my dear. You've got three saves that you need to make at a three. So uh, she gets a three, which was success, and, and a seven and a nine, which unfortunately will take her up to three wounds and eliminate her from the board as Aloy gets a, uh, a favored kill for Ishtar. So again, we're left with two back-to-back -back activations. We're gonna go with Furnace, and he's gonna see if he can secure this objective again, scavenge some more. He gets a five, he is successful. That is nice and easy. And then we've got Cinder. Now Cinder needs to try and help out Hearth here with this guy who's been accosting her. So she is gonna move her way down this ladder and just to the left and try and pop a shot. Now, unfortunately, this guy is definitely over 50% obscured by the cover. So he's gonna get plus two here to his save. We'll see if she can hit him first. So she has two dice on her ranged weapon, looking to beat his dexterity of a six. We get an eight and a one, so critical fail, but one goes through. And we'll see if this guy can save it. He's got a save of three up to five because of the cover. He gets a six, would you believe? He is not successful in saving it and takes a further point of damage. He's got one left, and we'll see what wound chart this does from Cinder. She gets... A five, that is sliced, minus two to his fighting skill. Not like he was using it much anyway, but every little helps. 
And here we are at the end of turn three and things are definitely swinging towards the Oathsworn's favor here with one person left alive and lots of supplies they can search. However, in the solo table, we have rolled something very interesting, which is I rolled 18, which is Vengeful. The next player model killed in this game will award the enemy two VP rather than one. And with Hearth at one HP left and this archer gonna be the first guy to go, he definitely could make the score a little bit more respectable in favor of these barbarians. We'll go to the final turn and we'll see how this resolves itself. So I suppose a large part comes down to this one here. As Hearth is kind of stumbling blinded from the last arrow that clipped her face, she's gonna now have to deal with a barrage of two shots from this guy. He's gonna take an aimed shot into her. So Hearth has a dexterity of a measly four. He needs to beat that with these two rolls, but he's aiming so he gets plus two to his dice roll. He gets a three up to five and a three up to five. That's two successes going through, right? Hearth will need to try and save these. Come on, girl, you need to three or below, three or below. Well, a 10 and a six is not gonna do it. That will unfortunately kill Hearth, remove her and score two VP for the bandits. I think we're definitely gonna need to try and get some revenge for that kill next. So with the goddess Ishtar clearly pleased the amount of bloodshed that's going on, Cinder's gonna, she's gonna succumb to the rage. She's gonna move six inches to here. And then she's just gonna try and charge this guy. She's had enough of using this bow. So she gets a six, she does get into him. She's gonna move herself around to here. And knowing that he's got a weakened fight skill, she's just gonna try and literally stick the crossbow in him at point blank range like a bayonet. So we'll just swing this round. Okay, so Cinder gets plus one attack for charging. She's got a fight skill of four versus this guy's one attack and a fight skill of two. So Cinder, Gets a two and a 10, that one fails. This guy gets a six, he misses. So can he save from this attack with his save of three or will this kill him? He gets an eight, he is not successful. Cinder absolutely obliterates him, takes him off the board for all of the shooting that he did at her and for killing her comrade half and that'll secure us another VP. So all that is left for us to do now is to see if we can mop up some of these supplies. So Furnace is gonna go. He gets a two, he secures a VP. And then Alloy, he's gonna move into this one, see what he gets. He gets a four, he is successful as well. And here we are at the end of the final turn and the heroic Oathsworn have been able to rebuff this barbarian attack and come out with a victory. I think it's about like nine points to five which is fantastic for this first game of the campaign. So now what is left to do is to do what we call the home section. Okay, so in the home phase of the game, we get the opportunity to kind of consolidate and build on what our warband has achieved. So in order, what we do is we apply any earned experience to models and level them up. We then get to either rest and explore their surroundings. We can buy, sell and trade with other players if there are any, or we can find a merchant if we get lucky. We then perform our passive abilities, try and see if we can remove any insanity from models that have died, and then we get ready for our next mission. So to begin with, everybody has been able to gain some bonuses from this. So that treasure that we were able to pick up earlier turned out to be Uan armor, which is brilliant. It gives plus two saves. So we've equipped that to our big strong boy Anvil just to make him a little bit more tankier. Everybody, like I said, has gained a passive ability. So Furnace has gained the inspiring passive ability, which allows him to try and remove insanity from models that have died for free rather than spending blessings, which is the normal way you do it. Cinder has gained Execution, which should give her an extra ability to gain more XP for models that she has killed if she gets lucky. We have got Vanguard for Anvil, which means that he gets to be deployed a little bit further when we start a game, which is really handy for him who's a little bit slower. Alloy has gained Quick Learning, which allows him to gain bonus experience after missions if he survives. And then we've got Hearth, who has Chemistry, which has the opportunity to make a healing potion. So. With the exploration or resting, well, I had two models that died, so I just decided to explore with the remaining ones. You have to pick a leader. So I picked Alloy, he went out and he was able to gain a power. Maybe he found a mysterious tree or fruit or something, but he's came back with the disrupt ability, meaning he can kind of confuse enemies or delay their actions, which is really, really good. And then the last part of the phase is we do our passive. So Furnish tried to use his inspiring to remove the insanity from Anvil, but unfortunately failed with that. So as the insanity builds up, that's going to become a problem. Hearth's got a similar issue. Cinder didn't get any of her bonuses for killing. Alloy didn't get any of his bonuses for XP and Hearth failed to make a potion. So all those bonuses I got didn't come through just yet, but they're, they're still learning. They're still trying to work things out. 
So in terms of experience, you get one XP for each victory point that a mod learns, one XP for surviving a mission, one for being on the winning team, and plus two for the leader if they survive instead of the plus one. So that leaves us with Furnace at level three, Cinder and Anvil still on level one, Alloy at level two, because you've got lots of points, and half at level one. So in total, we're looking at kind of a higher points cost as we go into the next game, meaning the enemies might be either more numerous or more sturdy. But that'll bring an end to this mission, and we'll go to the outro. And that'll bring this video to a close, and obviously there'll be plenty more brutality coming as me and my Usworn will try to work our way to either glory or avoiding death. Now, when I sent this video to Scott to have a look at and check rules for me, he did say I was very fortunate because the game can be, living up to its name, far more brutal. I definitely know that in my playtesting run. So, hopefully we'll be able to get through with everybody. The next mission is going to be probably trying to save a fellow ally who's been captured, because obviously we don't want them to die, otherwise they'll just be used for, like, meat or worse. So, I hope you've enjoyed this one. Let me know what you think in the comments below, and I will see you in the next video. Take care. Hi guys, and thank you so much for watching our videos. It means the world to us. If you want to see some more, they should be over here. And if you want to support this channel, keep these lights on. You can find links to our Patreon and merchandise in the description below. Take care.